Aggregate planning is an intermediate planning method used to determine the necessary resource capacity a firm will need in order to meet its expected demand. It is an intermediate range capacity planning, usually covering from 2 to 3 to about 12 to 18 months. In other words, it is the matching of capacity and the demand in such a way that costs are minimized. The term aggregate planning is defined as an operational activity which does an aggregate plan for the production process in advance of 2 to 18 months to give an idea to management as to what quantity of materials and other resources are to be procured and when, so that the total cost of operations of the organization is kept at minimum over that period. Aggregate planning is the process of developing, analyzing, and maintaining a preliminary, approximate schedule of the overall operations of an organization. The aggregate plan generally contains targeted sales forecasts, production levels, inventory levels, and customer backlogs. This schedule is intended to satisfy the demand forecast at a minimum cost. Properly done, aggregate planning should minimize the effects of short-sighted, day-to-day scheduling in which small amounts of material may be ordered one week, with an accompanying layoff of workers, followed by ordering larger amounts and rehiring workers the next week. This longer-term perspective on resource use can help minimize short-term requirements changes with the resulting cost savings. The main objectives of aggregate planning are to maximize customer service, minimize inventory investment, minimize changes in workforce levels, minimize changes in production rates, and maximize utilization of plant and equipment. In simple terms, aggregate planning is an attempt to balance capacity and demand in such a way that costs are minimized. The term aggregate is used because planning at this level includes all resources in the aggregate, for example, as a product line or family. Aggregate resources could be total number of workers, hours of machine time, or tons of raw materials. Aggregate units of output could include gallons, feet, pounds of output, as well as aggregate units appearing in service industries such as hours of service delivered, number of patients seen, etc. Aggregate planning does not distinguish among sizes, colors, features, and so forth. For example, with automobile manufacturing, aggregate planning would consider the total number of cars planned for not the individual models, colors, or options. When units of aggregation are difficult to determine, for example, when the variation in output is extreme, equivalent units are usually determined. These equivalent units could be based on value, cost, worker hours, or some similar measure. Aggregate planning is considered to be intermediate term in nature, as opposed to long or short term. Hence, most aggregate plans cover a period of 3 to 18 months. Aggregate plans serve as a foundation for future short-range type planning, such as production scheduling, sequencing, and loading. The master production schedule, in short MPS, used in material requirements planning, or MRP, has been described as the aggregate plan disaggregated. Steps taken to produce an aggregate plan begin with the determination of demand and the determination of current capacity. Capacity is expressed as total number of units per time period that can be produced. This requires that an average number of units be computed since the total may include a product mix utilizing distinctly different production times. Demand is expressed as total number of units needed. If the two are not in balance, equal, the firm must decide whether to increase or decrease capacity to meet demand or increase or decrease demand to meet capacity. In order to accomplish this, A number of options are available. Options for situations in which demand needs to be increased in order to match capacity include Number 1. Pricing Which includes varying pricing to increase demand in periods when demand is less than peak. For example, matinee prices for movie theaters, off-season rates for hotels, weekend rates for telephone service, and pricing for items that experience seasonal demand. Number 2. Promotion which includes advertising, direct marketing, and other forms of promotion are used to shift demand. Number 3. Back ordering. By postponing delivery on current orders demand is shifted to period when capacity is not fully utilized. This is really just a form of smoothing demand. Service industries are able to smooth demand by taking reservations or by making appointments in an attempt to avoid walk-in customers. 
Some refer to this as partitioning demand. Number 4. New Demand Creation A new, but complementary demand is created for a product or service. When restaurant customers have to wait, they are frequently diverted into a complementary, but not complementary, service, the bar. Other examples include the addition of video arcades within movie theaters, and the expansion of services at convenience stores. Number 5. Options which can be used to increase or decrease capacity to match current demand. Which include Hiring or laying off By hiring additional workers as needed or by laying off workers not currently required to meet demand, firms can maintain a balance between capacity and demand. Over time by asking or requiring workers to work extra hours a day or an extra day per week, firms can create a temporary increase in capacity without the added expense of hiring additional workers. Part-time or casual labor By utilizing temporary workers or casual labor, workers who are considered permanent but only work when needed, on an on-call basis, and typically without the benefits given to full-time workers. Inventory Finished goods inventory can be built up in periods of slack demand and then used to fill demand during periods of high demand. In this way no new workers have to be hired, no temporary or casual labor is needed, and no overtime is incurred. Subcontracting Frequently firms choose to allow another manufacturer or service provider to provide the product or service to the subcontracting firm's customers. By subcontracting work to an alternative source, additional capacity is temporarily obtained. Cross-training Cross-trained employees may be able to perform tasks in several operations, creating some flexibility when scheduling capacity. Other methods While varying workforce size and utilization, inventory buildup or backlogging, and subcontracting are well-known alternatives, there are other, more novel ways that find use in industry. Among these options are sharing employees with counter-cyclical companies and attempting to find interesting and meaningful projects for employees to do during slack times. Now, let's look into the aggregate planning inputs and outputs. In this table we can see all the necessary inputs required in aggregate planning. The important ones are including availability of resources, cost of equipments, cost of inventories etc. The output generated mainly includes the total cost of plan and estimated levels of inventory, employment etc. These outputs are very significant in the decision making. So, what are the main benefits of aggregate planning? It helps to determine demand for each period, determine capacities for each period, determine pertinent company policies, determine unit cost based on all relevant sources, develop alternative plans and calculate the cost for each. And finally, aggregate planning helps to choose the best overall plan based on company objectives and cost.